So it's a hollow core to the rotor. Yep. And then a 12 foot diameter ro rotor. Yep. Inside the stator. Yeah, when we go upstairs, I'll find the weights for these small machines. We have those listed up there. Yeah, so you can see that this whole thing is the shift ring. These wickets are tied to the shift ring there, and then the wickets are directly under each one of these big parts here. And right now, they're in the fully closed position, and then as they open up, water comes in. Water comes in, and then it's spins the turbine. And the, turbine the turbine for this one is, the I think it's this machine, is the one that's straight across from the general store. So you can get a sense of the scale of that turbine okay. that's underneath us here. It's the one that's sitting there on, on the Main Street. Okay, yeah. okay. We started in hard times to bring us all in Into the laughter through thick and through thin For public power enthusiasts without an I'm Paul Docker, a Senior Manager of Energy Resource Strategy and Planning for Seattle City Light and an Energy Enthusiast. I'm Almaz Nagesh, a Principal Resource Planning Analyst for Tacoma Power, an energy systems researcher, and of course, an energy justice enthusiast. And where are you recording from today, Almaz? Today, I am recording from Kigali, Rwanda. Nice. I'm Conley Byers, an Environmental Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, researching grid decarbonization and electricity market design. Are you still in Zurich, Conley? I am still in Zurich, yes. Okay, this is a very uh, world, globe-spanning yes. recording. What, what about you, Farhad? I'm I'm in uh, warmer, warm, uh, warmer weather Melbourne at the moment, so we've just <laughs> gone through the winter. Uh, oh. And as folks know, I'm with uh, a research fellow at OIS and director at SP. I'm sorry, Paul. Farha, can you say warmer weather Melbourne fast three times? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> without looking at really have to do that. <laughs> Well, this season on Public Power Undergrounding, we're both globe spanning and we continue to talk about the energy transition trifecta of electrification, markets, and people. On today's episode, we're going to talk about big, spinny, synchronous electricity generation with the operators of Seattle City Light Skagit Hydro Project. I had a fascinating and great in-person conversation with both the chief operating officer of Seattle City Light and a protection and controls engineer that uh, operates the generation. Fascinating discussion. We got into some control protection control schemes and how it relates to the big spinny synchronous generator and we got to talk about a, a, the a C, a career operator of hydro projects about how that operation differs from different uh, like wind and solar and and uh, fossil conventional generation so fascinating discussion before we get there we're going to talk about with our esteemed colleagues globe spanning experts on the energy system about common fallacies of the energy system we're going to talk about common misconceptions about elements of governance, engineering, history, physics, or politics that our contributing scholars frequently come across and have to correct. And I'm calling the segment Popular Heresy and Unpopular Opinion. Farhad, you recently posted uh, a thread of similar theme on Twitter, the core fallacies we tend to adopt in electric market design. So I'll start. I'll start with you. What fallacies from industry pundits do you frequently have to correct? I think one of the things, um, you know, coming from at least what used to be a staunchly energy only market, the, the, there's, you still get a common thread of discussion that centers around this a, a point and variance of it that says, energy and capacity and are not the same thing they're different so you need to be um, thinking about energy prices but you also need to be thinking about capacity um, and that's something which again depending on um, how you think about the problem you know there, there are aspects to that where you can see why that thread emerges but 
fundamentally, when you talk about the core principles of electricity market design, that is, they are the same thing. So the energy, the, the, the spot market is designed um, to service the system in a reliable and secure manner. And it's, it's meant to be designed in a way that allows for that to happen. And so when, when people talk about, you know, the traditional reason or justification for um, capacity markets, really being that the energy market doesn't value uh, value scarcity or value value the, the investment or the resource adequacy commodity. I think one of the misconceptions there is that that's a fundamental fact or fundamental um, uh, that's inherent to the, the spot market, whereas that's only a result of actually any constraints that you put on the spot market. Now, you know, they may be political in some ways and some of those constraints may need to be there or may be hard to remove. Um, but I think one of the important things to, to know is that, that um, when you're thinking about the system and resource adequacy, you know, I, ideally they're the same thing. And, and so what you're trying to do is to get any sort of mechanism that you put on top of that spot market if you need it to reflect the inherent scarcity that that spot prices themselves give in terms of that that you know that value of electricity on a minute to minute or or hour to hour basis. Okay, well we I need some help. Can somebody voice this heresy for me a little bit? So Arnie Olson, a, a friend of the underground and a scholar himself. Uh, who works at E3, he also often talks about capacity as like orthogonal to the energy in the energy system. Like it's a separate vector of energy service and electricity generation. Is that the fallacy you're speaking to, Farhad? Or what? what, what is the, when you hear this fallacy, what does it sound like? So it sounds like something that that people say, well, you know, the energy price doesn't really reflect it doesn't remunerate um, capacity value. Right. It doesn't remu remunerate dispatchability. That's that's the one which gets my uh, really gets my goat. And and I think one of the things that you know when 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 I used to work at AEMO, um, which is the Australian Energy Market Operator, um, there was a, a common graph that we did that we started to do because just because people would start to make that discussion that argument, and it was actually looking at the value that different resources, you know, dispatchable all the way from sort of wind, solar to something like gas and coal, their uh, essentially their captured price in the market, and it was really interesting to see that range. And and quite often, you know, wind and solar had the lowest captured price because they were intermittent or they weren't necessarily available all of the time. Uh, whereas something which was much more dispatchable storage, for example was able to capture and respond to different price events in real time. And so that that was something which, you know, doesn't mean that there's there's no need for anything else. And, and, you know, there's a big broader debate that goes on, but it's just how you contextualize what that other thing needs to be. And, and that's where I guess I just draw that distinction between it. You know, I just don't firmly believe that it's a separate thing. I think they're, they're essentially one of the same things. It's just more whether you hedge that risk or not right so rather than saying you know capacity is a separate thing that we don't value it's basically saying hey yep energy prices can be volatile but we we you know there's some need for stability and so we need to create a financial or a hedging instrument to hedge that volatility and that's that's kind of how i look at the problem rather than they being separate things yeah i think that's a great explanation and you know maybe one way to think about this or phrase this is that the service that we want at the end of the day is energy at a certain time. The service that we want isn't capacity. And now usually, you know, if you're going to make an argument for some kind of capacity mechanism, and I think you legitimately can make an argument, right? You know, there's certainly, you know, I, I might disagree with some of those arguments, but they, they stem from there being something gone wrong in the energy market. So, you know, the way Far had mentioned this, one easy element is that there's a price cap in the market, which means that you're not going to be valuing the the scarcity 
you know, when energy is really valuable at a certain time and place to the extent that you would without a price cap, and therefore you might have to do something else. Um, but yeah, I think it helps to just kind of strip it back to first principles and say, what is it that we're trying to provide? And ultimately that's energy at a certain time and location. So is the fallacy here not that uh, the electricity price includes capacity or doesn't include capacity? It, the fallacy is that uh, people who assert that the uh, energy price can't include the capacity value of the resource. And so like assertion that you never will is the fallacy. It is. It doesn't seem like it's a fallacy that some markets don't and that there are mechanisms maybe that we need to explore to make to add some uh, price formation so that the spot does. But the fallacy isn't that it doesn't, it's that it can't. Is that, am well, I so getting I that right? We have to, I think you have to step away from this idea that capacity is something that we need or something that we specifically are trying to remunerate, right? So you're trying to value energy at a given time and location. And then in that long run equilibrium mix, the idea is that through that revenue stream, you would have enough to, you know, if producers are perfectly inelastic in the long run, meaning that they can adapt to, you know, whatever level the market is demanding in the very long run, then you would find an equilibrium point where producers are no longer making any profit, right? So everyone in the market is happy to be there, but no new entrant wants to come in, right? It's just breaking even. That's what an equilibrium means in a market. And so you still want those short run prices to be able to cover the capital costs as well as the operating costs. And in theory, right, just the basic microeconomic theory of how short run price signals work, that's still true in energy markets. And so it's not per se, you know, that we're trying to say, you know, capacity is the product we need, like energy at a certain time and place is the project is the product that we're after or the service we're after. And that though the revenue from the market in the long run equilibrium ought to, uh, ought to um, be enough to cover the capital costs for that amount of capacity of these different resource types that provide that energy at that time and place. Definitely lots of like complications and nuance there, right? Like there's reasons why, mm -hmm. you know, we rarely use only short run, uh, you know, uh, energy markets and there's a lot of, you know, things happening at the edges, but that's kind of the stripped down to its core basic idea. So the fallacy that I heard was that capacity is in and of itself a service that we should be mm -hmm. going after. It's actually energy at a certain time and place. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. I'm glad we started here because uh, actually in the conversation, we talk about the value of hydro generation and the services it provides to the grid that are very valuable and unique that aren't captured in spot prices. And I think really what we're emphasizing here is that that is a problem of the spot price formation, not necessarily a capacity mechanism that we should be compensating. Yeah. And so maybe we'd have to dig in a little bit deeper to that statement about, you know, what it is that's not being, you know, valued in the, the way the market is currently designed. But, you know, at least again, if we strip this back to, you know, the basics, uh, an energy storage resource is fundamentally bidding its opportunity cost. Right. And you you have the same kind of dynamic where if you were a central planner making an optimization problem, you could find the same answer to your question in terms of what resources to build and when to operate them as you could if you had a market with perfect competition and marginal pricing where the marginal price of those energy storage resources is its opportunity cost. So it's figuring out based on what it's expecting to happen in the past and future, how it would bid. So, you know, of course, real world is much more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. Yeah. And this actually, so Farhad, you were recently on the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies podcast to talk about your recent paper on hedging risk and the energy transition and how it changes. And I, to like back this up to a prior conversation we had about with you about that paper on this podcast, in some ways, as I was hearing you, it's not the capacity that we need to value. It's the hedging practices. And there is a difference in forward markets about that delta, um, but, you know, the the 
risk premium that we accept in forward hedging contracts to make sure we mitigate the spot price risk that comes as a result of compensating fully for all the services that are necessary in the spot price. Is that connecting the prior conversations in this one together? Yeah, I, I think it is. And I kind of put it in the way when, you know, maybe um, 10, 12, 12 years ago now, from now I used to be doing, I used to basically be doing investments. So we would be part of a, an investment team um, in the US who was, was actually looking at investing in, you know, infrastructure assets, be it a toll road, be it a power plant, be it whatever. And one of the challenges um, of investment is, you know, when you're going to, so we, we all know that energy prices are volatile and, you know, maybe in, in most of the years I'll make a low return and then something will happen and there'll be some sort of price spike and, you know, maybe one in 10 years, there'll be just record outcomes and we'll just make all, all of this money. Now that is actually a very hard proposition to take to an investment committee because that level of uncertainty and risk is difficult for investors that are traditionally more um, worried about risk and, and worried about volatility. So what you're looking to do is kind of rather than have a profile revenue and or profit profile that goes like this, you're kind of wanting something that goes kind of like this and maybe, you know, maybe goes a little bit around the edges. For our audio Absolutely. audience, the first visual was a big <laughs> swinging of the hand. The second yeah. visual was a nice, smooth like line with his hand. Got it. Go, keep yeah. going far ahead. I, I think think of a big, you know, skipping rope, right? Like the sine wave, of, you know, market it's sort of volatility. So many investors are really looking for long term stability in their cash flows, and so having something which can go from Twenty dollars a megawatt hour, or negative thousand a megawatt hour, to fifteen thousand dollars a megawatt hour. That's a that's a very different risk profile, especially when you consider in today's environment. Not only do you consider if you're let's say developing all these assets, right? And we need to build so many new assets, storage, renewables. It's not that's just one component of the risk. You've got development risk you've got permitting risk you've got construction risk you've got interconnection risk so there's like a whole slew and so if you tell an investor and a developer like yep you've got all these risks plus you've also got this massive volatility and uncertainty um, where you may make your money in on, you know in a really good year but maybe a lot of the times you may not make your capital costs that's a hard proposition. So that's where rather than saying that there's this whole separate product to stabilize those revenues, what you're actually looking for more is like a hedge, something that exchanges those cash flows. So it takes takes away the volatility, gives it to someone who can who who likes or wants that type of exposure, and in return you get something that's a little bit more stable. Mm -hmm. So maybe to emphasize what Farhad is is advocating here is some form of a forward energy market rather than a forward capacity market. Um, and, you know, this is also an interesting question when we think about how capacity markets are developing, right? If we think that what a capacity market might be trying to get at is doing some more of this risk hedging, well, the more granular those capacity markets become in terms of certain zones, in terms of times of year, or they're less years forward, the less it serves as that risk hedge. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that you might need to do that is because it's really difficult to make that translation from capacity to energy at a time and place, right? And so they're getting more granular, but, you know, at, at some point, I think it would probably make more sense to just say, well, maybe we need to have more of a forward energy market rather than a forward capacity market, if that's really, you know, what we're after is that risk hedging. And if you had a forward energy market that incorporated these premiums, these risk premiums associated with um, services for a later spot market, you would remunerate those types of resources that had characteristics that could provide that forward contract. So the type of flexible resources, maybe like a hydro resource with, you know, a lot of ability to open its wicket gate and go from zero power to full power in 12 seconds, which is what our guests are talking about. Um, that is the type of resource who could then sell some forward hedging contract and then 
be remunerated for that capability without producing energy in all moments. So instead of just recovering on a spot market, they would have some forward contract to stabilize their revenues. Is that the concept here? I think so. I think so. I think I think it it um I think ultimately if you if you're going down the path of trying to stabilize or or trying to create some sort of contract ultimately you want that contract to reflect what the resources can do and and today it's much more about a portfolio of resources than it is about a single resource so capacity markets tended to be designed or the 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 even the contractual structure of capacity markets tended to suit resources that have low capital costs but high marginal costs short run marginal costs and there's you know a fantastic paper by Jacob Mays in 2019 uh, in in nature energy that that essentially does this you know shows this point in a very elegant way and that means that that those markets have traditionally supported resources like fast start gas and and the like um but i think what's relevant today and and, and to Connolly's point here is that it's not just fast start gas today that you need you actually need a portfolio you need um resort wind and solar to to run at the times that are available you need other firming resources you need storage and so what's the best portfolio to actually deliver energy when it's needed and so i think that's where maybe the forward contract is better aligned than a, a capacity you know option contract which is kind of what capacity markets tended to be based on and so that that you know that potentially makes more sense as you think about a transition to a really a portfolio of resources just in just sort of one set of resources providing all of that firming so if you're doing a forward energy market right now we talk about two settlement markets so we have a spot a day ahead so has this become like three settlement markets where you settle on forwards you settle on day ahead and then you settle on spot or is it something different and i need to move on from this i know i'm just asking too many questions ah curiosity gets you every time well so i guess critically there are forward markets right forward trading for yep, energy already are. exists. And so this is kind of one of those big questions is, you know, maybe why is it at a level that we think might be less than socially optimal? And so those were some of those points that I tried to cover in that resource adequacy talk before, so that, that there might be reasons why consumers are under incentivized to enter into these kinds of contracts. Farhad has an interesting recent paper showing that it might just be very expensive for traditional thermal resources to offer these kinds of contracts. And, you know, for this combination of reasons, perhaps we see less forward energy trading than we would think we would see based on how we think everybody's risk assessment ought to be working. Um, but there are, there are a number of proposals out there now for how one might implement some form of a mandatory forward energy market, but there's a lot of debate there as to who would fall under that requirement and you know, how how would that be traded on what time scale, you know, kind of the auction design part of it. So maybe we could kind of separate this into, you know, I think what we're talking about a lot here is, is maybe more the contract design, but the auction design is also important as well. Energy Northwest is proud to provide clean, abundant and reliable energy to help meet our growing needs. Energy Northwest is proudly advancing the Northwest's clean energy future. I knew that. Yeah, of course. I knew of that. Course. I knew that. They also have a great training program, which isn't in this promo, but I'll just provide it as a promo as well. It's, they have a great internship program uh, where college graduates can get an internship through Energy Northwest. Uh, I've talked about it many times on this podcast. I'm a big fan of that program. Wasn't in this ad read. They didn't write it in, but I'm just inserting it because I'm such a big fan. All right. Well, sign up, boys and girls. Learn more about nuclear energy and its full potential at energy-northwest.com. That's energy-northwest.com. Okay. We went down that rabbit hole. Thanks for clearing that up, Conley. Um, do you have a fallacy that you want to talk about? Sure. Okay. So I guess, well, I'll try to keep this one a little bit shorter because um, it does relate to what we were just talking about, which is the, the fallacy is that the recovery of capital costs is impossible in an energy market with resources with zero or low marginal costs. So 
the risk assessment certainly changes, right? As Farhad was talking about, uh, you know, visually, and then as explained uh, explained by Paul with the, you know, that the, the profits are gonna look really different year to year potentially, right? Like if you have a lot of zero variable cost resources, perhaps you're expecting that prices would be very low most of the time and occasionally much higher. But there's nothing about that situation that changes the fundamental microeconomic theory of this, right? It's just that the risk assessment changes. So an investor may not want to be in that market, you know, with no other kinds of, you know, contracting available. But the idea that the energy market marginal prices wouldn't, in the long run equilibrium, recover the capital costs, that part still stays. We're still fine on that front in theory. You know, what might really happen in the future as well is that if we are able to have a lot of flexible demand in the market, that price stream is going to look really different, right? If you have, if you assume that we're mostly going to have fixed demand, then yeah, you'd have a lot of very flat, small prices, then occasional giant price spikes to the value of lost load, which is, you know, this administratively determined value to demand being curtailed. But if demand can actually participate and say how much it values each segment of demand, then you would have demand setting the price much more often. And so that price stream may not even look quite as skewed as perhaps we're thinking it might be if we're still really focused on this idea of inelastic demand. This is all over Twitter, right? That mm. uh, the, the, the electric market design breaks under zero marginal cost resources. And, uh, and I think you well articulated that actually in theory, that is not necessarily. There's also some like recent, there's a, a bunch of, really good academic work underscoring this point that actually the theory still works. And in practice, I think I remember, uh, frankly, we're talking about Jacob Mays all the time here, uh, a Mays uh, and Jesse Jenkins paper that talked about the returns um, may actually be more stable because you have less of the, uh, they may be more stable for wind and solar resources because you have less of the risk of natural gas that actually it's a, a different risk, which relates maybe to your recent paper, Farhan. Do y'all, am I remembering that right? And is there? Yeah. So what Paul's talking about there is very much in this risk assessment, risk management camp, right? So, you know, we can definitely say in a deterministic setting, right? So if everybody was not risk averse, there's no uncertainty in the market, very easy for this to still work out in theory. You have your spot prices, occasional really high price spikes, and it's still going to recover the capital costs of your resources in the long run equilibrium mix. Now, like, let's add some complications, right? Which is now you also have the, the risk assessment or, you know, the risk aversion of investors. And so from that perspective, you know, how well does this short run energy market work for them? And so what that paper that Paul was bringing up was showing was that, uh, that for variable energy resources like wind and solar, they don't face those fuel price uncertainty that thermal generators face. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, might be a little counterintuitive, but for an investor thinking about investing with a natural gas plant, you know, it may not be, uh, it, it may not be, you know, worse off uh, than investing with wind or solar in that uh, high variable renewables future. I, I totally, I mean, I was just, I think that was a great, actually a great summary. And I, I actually didn't have much to add to that. That was a great explanation. Um, I guess the one, the one thing that um, I'll just point to or more just for reference for folks, there was a, um, a recent uh, working paper by Tom Brown's team at TU Berlin, which talks about this now issue of price formation when you have demand coming into the mix and demand playing a more active role. And what it showed was that as we would expect with more zero run, zero short run resources like wind and solar in the mix, you have more volatility in pricing. Most, you know, when, when wind and solar is shining or, or blowing, wind's blowing, you've got a lot of, you know, zero or negative prices or low prices, not necessarily always zero, but lower prices. And then potentially when they're not there, these sort of really extreme spikes almost to the value of lost load or the market cap. Uh, but what they showed was you don't actually need a whole lot uh, because of the ways that bid curves tend to kind of get structured in the market. You don't actually need a lot of demand actually responding to the price for you to kind of bring that volatility to, to more reasonable levels because of the way that our 
bid or offer curves are structured kind of being these very sharp, you know, mm -hmm. well, especially as you get to the really high levels, they tend to kind of shift, you know, a few megawatts can change the price setting from being, you know, 5,000 um, or 300, right? So that, mm -hmm. that differential is very small. And so you don't need a lot of consumer when we talk about, you know, well, we don't want all, you know, no consumers, all consumers are not going to respond to price. Well, we may not need everybody to respond to price. There are people that, that are going to be inelastic that maybe don't want to respond, but you don't necessarily need that much to, to change that price, uh, the price setting. And so that's, that to me was what I'm really most looking forward to as we look forward to the next, as we look to the next few years is how the demand picture changes and, and, we, we currently, in in many markets, don't have, or maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but certainly in the Australian markets, demand doesn't often set the price um, because it's either generation or if it's a price spike, maybe it goes to the, the price cap or somewhere close to it. But demand mm -hmm. rarely sets the price. So that would be that'd be a really interesting thing and how that comes about will be, it's, it's still a challenge, but... I think that's that's quite exciting. Yeah, and there's some interesting, I think, debates to be had there about these, you know, imagine in a future market where the price is mostly being set by demand rather than mostly being set by suppliers and different supplier technologies and how you think about market power mitigation and everything else in that context. But yeah, interesting things coming. Um, I do have another fallacy to share if we have time. Yeah, we're, we we so, got it. Go for it. All right. So if one jurisdiction has a policy that changes the equilibrium resource mix, the most efficient policy response is to change the design of the market so that the old equilibrium resource mix is restored. So this is this is a fallacy that I think you see a lot, especially with capacity markets or thinking about how do we respond to subsidies coming in from one, say, state in the U.S., but the market is across multiple states. So I think there's often this idea that, okay, well, there's a subsidy for this technology in this state, which lowered the, the clearing price of some market in the broader market across multiple states. So what we ought to do is go in and make sure that those old technologies get to be in the market at the same level or are compensated to the same level as they were previously. And now this isn't a very efficient thing to do, right? Now you very well might say, okay, this is a form of regulatory risk, right? Something changed about kind of the rules of the game, a subsidy was entered, and you could you could fairly make an argument that you might need to compensate losers in that situation, right? But you wouldn't wanna do it via changing the market equilibrium back to the old one, right? Because this in effect is the same as if say, there's some new technology, and instead of being subsidized by some other jurisdiction, just there was innovation and its costs came down. And so it was able to bid at a lower price or this new technology entered the market, thus the clearing price went down and everybody in the market felt that. But you know, that's that's the new equilibrium, right? Like you have this new equilibrium, the most efficient thing to do is to work with it, right? Now you can have the argument separately about whether you wanna compensate losers, but you shouldn't try to go back to what the equilibrium resource mix was before. Um, and I think that the reason that this happens a lot, especially in the context of capacity markets and minimum offer rules, is that often what we're procuring from a capacity market isn't very, it doesn't necessarily coincide with what we're hoping to procure from a capacity market, which really is energy at a certain time in the future. And it gets kind of, you know, you get layers of band-aid solutions and trying to figure out like, what is the, you know, how do you translate this capacity value to that concept later? Um, and so there's just, I think this idea of, well, you know, say this, uh, this thermal technology that's dispatchable and we think we need it for, you know, reliability reasons to have, you know, energy at a certain time and location in the future. And now if we're, you know, letting all these renewables into the capacity market, they're not getting the amount of revenue they would need to stay in the market. Like, well, that tells you something, you know, if you really think that they would be needed in, you know, your perfect central planner case in the future and the market solution isn't providing that, to me, that says something about what you're procuring in the market doesn't add up. 
Yeah, you understood the assignment kindly. This was a hot take. This was an unpopular opinion, uh, and you brought it. Uh, they, they, I, I appreciate it. I and you got to at the end there where I was thinking, which is it can't expose something, a truth about the system that then you mm -hmm. need to think about, right? It can be the case that um, that the the changing in an innovation, innovative new resource, maybe like hyper. Uh, hyper optimized for a specific market design, then maybe that market design doesn't fully compensate for all of the services you actually need in spot to balance the system. I'll come back to hydro resources and like the grid inertia and system security aspect that they do provide. And when you get to uh, a bunch of deployment of wind and solar, sometimes like you're exposing that actually there is this uncompensated thing on the grid that was just kind of taken for granted. Um, and now we may need to think about how this price formation in the spot can do that or how to do that differently. But it is, I think it exposed something real in some cases. Uh, is that fair? It does expose something real in some cases, but your fallacy still, I think, stands. Yeah. So I think the fallacy, you know, is is this idea that, you know, if there was this subsidy somewhere else, the most efficient thing to do in terms of like overall social welfare is to go back to the old one. And, you know, I think that that's not true, right? But if you think that this new equilibrium resource mix won't give you what you want, then it tends to me something about how you're designing that market, the product you're clearing for isn't the product you actually want. Well said. We're going to do Ahmad's and then we're going to do a lightning round for anybody else's like fallacies that we want to touch on real quick. So Ahmad's, what's, uh, what's one of your fallacies? Okay. So I'm, I'm, I, I got some inspiration from my location since I'm here. Um, so I, I asked the, I, I'm in a guest house here and there's folks from all over the, um, uh, the world that, that are in this guest house. And I, and I asked them some, you know, what was something about the electric grid that, that annoys you? And I was hoping that I would be able to pull a fallacy out of what they say. Um, but there was one, um, that person that said that in Ethiopia, there's tons of hydropower, um, but instead of using that power to serve their um, local, locally, their own population, they sell it on the market to the neighboring countries. Um, and it, she says, it's just a frustrating situation. And you can argue about whether or not, you know, selling the power um, uh, outside of the country and then using the revenue to develop the country is better or worse than just using that uh, power um, 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 directly. That's not the, <laughs> the purpose of this podcast, but it, 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 um, it made me think about how um, we've actually had in our IRP process a customer uh, or a stakeholder who asked if Tacoma Power was going to um, have any uh, special rates to discourage data center growth. Um, because, and so that brings me to the fallacy, which is that large customers, so be it your neighboring countries or the data centers or the large industrial customers, but that these large energy, new energy users are, are taking the power away from the, the, the little guy and that their costs are gonna um, go up. And while that that can be the case, um, I I don't think that it is necessarily um, uh, the case. Uh, and and when costs are actually allocated justly, we can avoid those types of situations. And so um, and because like when I, when I go back to the data centers, like so, like it, those are so important to just modern day life, um, and we don't often think about. Um, and yeah, Paul sort of. Uh, tied this one in uh, to me. A lot of times we think of uh, energy as the system being uh, a bubble and don't recognize that like your cell phone, like every little thing that you do in your life is powered by, uh, in this case, uh, not just energy, but the data centers that use that energy. Um, and we don't tend to put, connect those connect those dots. Um, and so uh, the unpopular opinion that goes with that uh, and you've heard me say, I want to say as many times as I possibly can while I can, that I do believe that our infrastructure is a public good and it should be paid for like a public good through taxes and in such a way that those who have more can pay more. And then these sorts of um, um, fallacies or, or opinions that, um, you know, our power is being taken or people aren't paying their fair share uh, might be sort of mitigated. 
Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Almaz, and especially like pointing out this, if people are paying their fair share, right, kind of goes back to this idea of, you know, if we're thinking about transmission upgrades and beneficiary pays and, you know, the reasons why that can be kind of difficult to do in reality, but, you know, it still seems like kind of the good gold standard to aim for. And when we're thinking about data centers, you know, this is, I think, what's in the news a lot now is this debate mm -hmm. about would it be good to co-locate nuclear power or co-locate data centers with existing nuclear power resources. And, you know, on the one hand, like this might prevent a lot of transmission upgrades or distribution upgrades needing to happen. But on the other hand, you really have to do the full analysis of that, right? Because if, you know, this one node here that used to be sending power elsewhere is now mostly consuming the power it's creating, you know, there's now a lot of other nodes in the system that need more energy. So new resources still have to be built to serve that. And, you know, because of the nature of the physics of electricity flows, you could do something that one node and, you know, have a big effect in terms of what upgrades you needed elsewhere now that you've changed that power flow and are needing to add new resources elsewhere. So it's quite a comprehensive question. You know, it's not a very easy one, I think, to say like, you know, universally it's a good or bad thing if you're gonna have a new natural, or you're gonna have a new data center, I mean, that you should or shouldn't put it at the nuclear power station. You have to kind of think about that carefully and really figure out how you would allocate the, the costs from that. You know, when you said that nuclear, I was thinking small modular nuclear. So like, it's just, it's serving that low, like a distributed energy resource and not even um, um, like impacting, basically a micro gas, so like not even yeah. connected to the transmission. That's what I thought you were saying uh, initially, but you were, you meant like the normal. Yeah, Talon Energy facilities. signed a deal with this recently. So this is in the news okay. because there is a data center that's going to, you know, go in Amazon one that's going to be at a nuclear power plant oh. and this is kind of the debate now is well uh, should they be getting you know this nuclear power plant you know does are the subsidies for it you know adequately reflecting this new contract it's signing is the new data center actually going to be you know have paying its fair share for whatever effects it causes in the grid by diverting that power so like there's a lot of things to talk about there but certainly the idea of having future data center growth combined with small modular reactors, very interesting, but, you know, we're not there yet with small modular reactors. No, yes, yes. Right <laughs> if we get there, but we're you, not there yet. It can be. <laughs> so, you know, this is reminding me of the nuance that Paul added uh, in one of the previous fallacies. Um, it is very possible for the large customers uh, and perhaps there are cases where they are not paying their fair share and costs are being um, put off onto other customers. Um, but it does not have to be that way. So it's not a mm -hmm. necessary part of having data centers. Yeah. And there's, it kind of also brings up, you know, the parallel like uh, nimbyism question, right? It's like, okay, well, where mm -hmm. do you do this? And, you know, uh, you know, for something like a data center that really could be geographically in many different places. Um, you know, you have this question of, well, who gets to make the, who gets the decision-making authority of, of where it's going to go? Kind of in this parallel question of, you know, for building new housing, you know, is that decision-making authority local or is it more regional? And, you know, even if it's more regional, you might find the best for that whole region of a place to put this new, you know, whatever it is, but you still could have, you know, local objections to it. So lots of mm -hmm. nuance there. Oh, uh, and I think tons what, of it. What what complicates this issue as well is you're you're at the nexus of you know what is a more competitive side of the market which is you know generation and supply which tends to be more you know open access if you want to connect to a region generally the principles are you should be able to connect though maybe not in practice and then the other side of you know across the maybe not even the chasm it's sort of this small little stream is regulated utility land which decides where do i upgrade the grid or where do i build more transmission and and in that type of situation it really as as i think the discussion shows you're really getting into the real detail of things like the cost allocation which maybe puts most people to sleep but but when you're thinking about something like a big data center how you allocate those costs now are you looking when you're looking at the advantage you know the allocation as between who get who's um 
who receives a surplus versus a deficit and then allocating the cost of transmission to that, if you're grouping the data center together with all of the customers, other customers in that region, one of the risks there is maybe the data center specifically receives all the surplus, but you're now spreading those costs across everybody. So okay. uh -huh. yep. this mm -hmm. becomes this, yep. this really, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a bear of a problem because you kind of, yeah. You, and, and unfortunately, you know, network regulation, there's a level at which you can't go below in terms of just creating those rules um, that can be followed and understandable and transparent and, and, and actually, you know, so you kind of all across these sort of regulated and competitive nexus of the market. And, and I think that's what makes this whole thing be challenging. Um, and, and, you know, ground for like uh, proposals and protests and that sort of stuff and kind of, you know, yeah. making the goodies and the baddies. And I think that's, that's, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the challenge there. I, I don't think it's, good or bad, I think ultimately people are connecting because they have a need and, you know, it's just making sure that it's a fair and equitable and, and a, um, a sensible way of allocating costs and, and benefits. I, I, you, you said it exactly as, as, as I would have at that, that last minute. Like, um, this is what excites me about this particular topic. You know, I'm the, the energy justice enthusiast, so just figuring out the, the, the right way for those costs to be spread in a way that's just is, um, yeah, that's something that interests me. I think about that a lot. So that's my fallacy, Paul. Well, I wanted to uh, follow up on the fallacy. Uh, the, what, what I hear your friend saying and what I hear in the discussion is this fallacy that the, there's an electricity system in isolation. And I, it really is like the electricity system, the energy system is part of an overall economic system that we need to account for. Um, and be be uh, be aware of. And that's actually I'll call back to our interview with Emily Grubert and uh, Dr. Franca Gropera and talking about how as we plan for the energy system, we should plan for the whole like the actual services we're providing, like heat, cooling. It's a planning for yeah. the community and the services of a community. And then you get a more holistic view. But this is this is such a dominant fallacy because of institutional domains. So we as electric utilities think about electricity system in isolation because that is our domain. That's where we can act. Um, but, you know, in order to actually have the more comprehensive view of the, you know, the the services that were that are necessary for our communities, it's hard to act on that because it's not your domain that has to be coordinated outside. So that to me is like a, one of the core fallacies that comes across within our system is the tendency to just view our system as, as, as in an isolation. isolation. Yep. Okay, so we got to do some lightning round for the last few fallacies here. I'll come back to you, Farhad. Any uh, lightning round fallacy you want to highlight? Uh, so this is probably specifically for the Northwest, but something that I hear a lot um, from the low-income advocates in my community um, is that we should be giving uh, rooftop solar to our low-income customers, um, and that's the best way to help them. Um, but as a utility that's really focused uh, and really successful in conservation, we know that you know weatherization, like getting a home um, uh, weatherized is far more important than putting rooftop solar on. And so that's one that we hear all the time. You know, rooftop solar oh, that's a great in Washington, one. not necessarily the best way to go. You got a one-liner to add, Farhad or Conley? Yeah, I can add a, add a, a one-liner. I think I might be unduly uh, picking on capacity markets for these. Um, but uh, so mine was capacity markets have nothing to do with interconnection queues. And uh, so I think this is a fallacy because if you have to certify that there is deliverable capacity at some point in the future, that requires a lengthy kind of analysis that takes a lot of time and it forces you into this connect and manage approach versus invest and connect, which we see in places like ERCOT, which are successful in adding a lot more energy resources more quickly than most other regions right now. Heck, I'll jump on the capacity markets training as well and uh, put another boot in um, that energy prices are volatile and capacity markets 
are not. Or energy markets are volatile, capacity markets are not. And I think um, probably folks from that that maybe are exposed to PJM in any way, shape, <laughs> or form probably will will have something to say about something about that. But I think that's that's been um, there not just recently, but but for a long time. So um, the only difference is it's something that maybe changes um, and and but you're fixed maybe for a year or three years or whatever that period is. But they're still volatile as well because the underlying commodity is volatile. Well, I'll add, I'll add a one-liner here, and that is that uh, institutions designed under a static system work under the, a dynamic system. So I think it is a fallacy that we're experiencing within the energy system that a lot of our institutions were built during times of fairly stable flat load and uh, a energy system and a transmission system that were already invested in and built. And we are entering a phase of a lot of dynamic changing to the system where we need to add stuff, where we uh, new load growth is occurring. And I think it's a fallacy that we can just rely on our existing institutions to navigate us through those dynamics. As you've all heard, one of my energy system analogies is that uh, you need that there's a PID controller on this electric system and we need right. to make sure we have all the right signals and we're building that control. Uh, our institutions around a control system that actually works under our changing dynamics. I actually think we need to like modernize our control system for a brand new dynamic in the energy system um, and relying on our existing controls in a new environment. It's going to, that can cause catastrophic failure. Okay. That was perfect. Thank you all for the fallacies and unpopular opinions. We're going to take a quick break. And then you'll hear from my colleagues at Seattle City Light that lead the operation of the Skagit River System Hydropower Projects. I'm recording on location at Seattle City Light's Skagit River Hydro Project with three power practitioners. Joining me is Mike Haynes, the Chief Operating Officer of Seattle City Light and career-long power system practitioner. Hello, Mike. Hey, Paul. Great to be here. Thanks. I'm very excited to have you and be here. As I understand it, you're some sort of mayor of the town. What town is this specifically? What's the name of the town? This is the town of New Halem, which was built in order to build the Skagit project. And are you, it's a company town? Company town, yes. And you're the mayor? Uh, sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, that, there we there we have it. Uh, Mike's the mayor. Uh, joining Mike and I are two operators for Seattle City Lights Hydro Facilities on the Skag Skagit River System. Will Anderson, the Senior Operations Manager for the Skagit Projects, and Brant March, Generation Supervisor at the Skagit Projects. Hi, Will. Hey, nice to meet you, Paul. Glad to be here. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. Hi, Brant. Hey, Good to be here. And do either of you live in the town? We both do. Yes. Both live in the town, company yep. town. Yes. You you owe your money to the company store. What's the song? Somebody knows the yeah, song. Yeah, I do. I owe my soul to the company store. That and the gorge in for it lunch. It comes out of my paycheck every two weeks. That's how you know. And I, I see there's a fudge uh, light in the window. Does that mean that there's, there's fudge? fudge. That means they're making fudge. That's there's... right. And are the employees in the general store... Seattle City Light employees. Yes, sir. And the people in the lunchroom are also Seattle City Light employees. Correct. They are. This is great. Thank you. Well, the Skagit River Hydroelectric Project is located in Whatcom, Skagit, and Snohomish counties of Washington State in the upper watershed of the Skagit River in the Cascade Mountains. The Skagit consists of three power gener generating facilities. Ross, Diablo, and Gorge, and includes over 100 miles of transmission lines from the Diablo switchyard to the Baffle substation serving the city of Seattle. We're here because system security and system strength are themes of this season on Public Power Underground, and these projects provide important grid services and black start capability for Seattle City Light and the grid. So I want to start with some just basic facts and specs about the generators that we're talking about. On the podcast, we have a segment that we, we call 30 Seconds of Theory, where we go over just some overarching contextual uh, topics for, for what we're ever gonna, whatever we're going to talk about. So I'm going to give you each a 30-second prompt to give us some context about the project. I'm going to start with you, Mike. <laughs> The mayor, the mayor of uh, mayor of the town, and thirty seconds or less. What's the difference between one a synchronous generator, two an asynchronous generator, 
and three, an inverter driven resource. Yeah, thanks for asking that of a mechanical engineer. That's I why I'm very it. happy. I am a mechanical engineer <laughs> asking a mechanical engineer. This felt right. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> mechanical engineers, uh, version of the truth. Uh, so synchronous basically means it runs at 60 hertz. Uh, the generator speed matches the frequency of the grid, essentially. And there's a whole bunch of math that goes with it, but that's a simple explanation. For asynchronous, the rotor actually speeds, it runs at a different speed than synchronous speed. And that <clears throat> speed uh, creates what's called a slip frequency that allows an induction motor or injection generator to generate power on, onto the grid. Wind turbines are asynchronous generators, as exactly. an example. And then uh, an inverter very simply converts DC power to AC power. So if you got wind generators, batteries, solar panels, they all go through an inverter to convert power so that they can <clears throat> provide power for grid. Great answer. Awesome. Mechanical engineer through and through. <laughs> loved it. Loved it. Well, do I remember correctly that you used to work on not synchronous generators or work Oh, uh, we had a couple uh, induction units in our portfolio, but most of our generators were synchronous. Okay, okay, nice. So you're up next. I'm going to ask you about the gen specs for these three projects. So, what what generators do we have at the Skyjet? So all of our projects? generators here are synchronous generators. Um, they're they're all they're all vertical hung Kaplan units. Uh, we'll we start at the top of the system at Ross Powerhouse, Francis. Francis. Francis, yeah. Oh, Francis. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, don't apologize. Now we get to understand the difference between what and what? <laughs> a Kaplan machine and a Francis machine. Yeah, what's the difference between these things that I d have never heard the distinction before? Oh, and I don't know if I should be embarrassed or not. No, no, it's it's so Kaplan machines, if you think about the Columbia River system, those okay. are Kaplan. Generally, we talk about low head, high volume machines are Kaplan, which they look a lot like a propeller. Okay. Some of those propellers have the ability to modulate the blades, and some of them are fixed. Okay. A Francis turbine is a lot like a squirrel cage. I'll let Will talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you think of it as the old, it might evolve from a water wheel, and if you if you had the inner the inner axle, and then you, you pull the water wheel out so it was elongated, so you wind up with a, a, a buckets okay. that go around it. So they don't pitch, they don't change shape. Um, they're a fixed dimension. Okay. So these are all the, like, propellers that move the generator. Yeah, we call yeah. them water wheels. Water yep. wheels. Yeah. Okay. So these are Francis water wheels, Correct. not... Kaplan. Correct. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, you're great. This is this made it fun. Thanks for thanks for making it so fun. So for the public audience out there, so Kaplan is low head, high volume. Francis is medium to high head and and relatively low volume okay. in terms of the amount of water going through. Just rule of thumb. Okay. So vertically hung. So the vertical generators. So you could have horizontal or vertical of either type of units. Uh, all all of ours are vertical. Uh, starting at Ross, we've got four four units. They're all 125 MVA units. Moving down to Diablo, we've got two 100 MVA units and then two 1.5, which are our Black Star units. Okay. And then down the gorge, we have 102 MVA, which is Gen 24. And then the three small units, which are the original 100-year-old units, are 38 MVA. And has anybody done the math in their head about how many MVA total that is? Yeah, we're like 832, yeah. but that's not total our installed total MBA. installed, but our license rating is different than that. These are very important things, too, because it's perfectly reasonable to have a different generator MVA rating than license MVA rating. What's your license? So is Ross, it in megawatts or mega, it's, it's, megavolt amps? It's in uh, megawatts, I megawatts. believe. Okay. At Ross, it is, uh, Ross is 380. It, we it's hard because we hardly ever run up at capacity. Right. Diablo is one eighty four, and Gorge is two two hundred two. I think. Okay, and the, and so we now the eight hundred and I forget now thirty two eight hundred and thirty two total MVA for all the generators, and we have two transmission lines that run four. two double circuit. Yeah. Okay, four transmission lines. <laughs> Mike, is it two double circuit, two thirty KVs, or is it actually four? Is it not double circuit? What's the right oh, way no, to describe? No, there's two sets of towers, so they're double circuit, two thirty KV. So okay, four lines, two double circuit. Okay, yeah. and how how many MVA can the transmission lines get out? What's the what's the line rating? We area? do have a summer and winter rating, and uh, 
Hold on. I, I don't want to misquote this, so I'm going to read it right out of our Thank you. Uh, facilities manual here. So, so for winter time, each line is 434 megawatts. Okay. And okay. Uh, the summertime, it's 310 megawatts per line. Okay. So our MVA ratings, a little bit lower than generated ratings, perfectly reasonable. Perfectly normal. I'm at 30 seconds of theory. Your next brand. Okay. Because I wanted to get, so we've got the specs, but can you give us some like impressiveness, like physical space? How, for people that aren't familiar with an MVA, how impressive are these things? Um, so uh, if you think about it in terms of households, that's how I like to see it. And okay. <laughs> households change, right? But yep. typically one megawatt or one MVA, the terms are kind of interchangeable depends on which engineering math you're Get using careful there's a couple mechanical okay engineers. Your units right. really so, matter. okay so you know megawatts are the real deal right that's, that's what that's what makes heat and that's, that's what the real power that's what turns motors so so but uh one megawatt of electricity of installed capacity is generally capable of of like satisfying 250 150 to 250 households depends on the climate you're in. Okay. So with our installed capacity, you guys can do the math. So, you know, 800 megawatts ish of installed capacity. Let's go with 150 households. You know, we can, we supply a lot of power or have the capability to. Okay. And, and as far as like the physical space they take up. So if you're in the generator, can you get close? You can yeah. obviously have to maintain these things, even if they are vertically hung. Oh, yeah. You still got to be able to like get close to them. How big are they? Like what? So, so Ross is our, Ross for the Skagit are our largest units. Uh, their MVA rating is 125, like uh, Will said. And the rotor, which is the, you know, where the magnetic poles are on, the rotor of that generator weighs a million pounds. Holy cow. And, Holy cow. And it's what, 30 feet in diameter? Was yeah. It? yeah. Right about. That's, that's huge. Yeah. Big synchronous generator. Permanent yeah. magnets on a synchronous no, generator? No. No. These are not. Okay. We got a very clear note. Mike, back to you. <laughs> um, is there any reference you can provide about how impressive like this generator capacity is versus other power projects? As I recall from prior conversations to you, you worked on some other conventional units earlier in your career. Can you just talk about how this compares in like scale of a project to some other types of power projects. Yeah, I yeah, I've, I've had the kind of pleasure, I guess, of working on coal units, peaker gas turbines, combined cycle gas turbines. I think one of the biggest if you don't know about the steam driven turbines, they're horizontal machines. They sp they go really fast, like 1800 or 3600 RPMs typically. Um, and so diameter, small, relatively small diameter, but high speed. Okay. And um, here, uh, and most hydro stations, um, the, we don't get anywhere near those types of speeds. The speeds here on this gadget are all probably less than 200 revolutions per minute versus 3,600 for a large coal-driven steam turbine. And um, what that means is you, you've, and we've described kind of physically how massive these machines are, but and, and uh, a rotor weighing a million pounds creates just this massive lumbering, uh, rotating inertia that's hard to describe unless you're physically standing next to it because it's actually, you can watch the shaft spin and you can actually almost count the rotation standing next to it because it's only going, it's going 120 RPMs, 140 RPMs, whatever the machine conditions uh, dictate. Um, so that's the biggest difference. If you're standing next to a steam turbine, it's just spinning really, really fast, kind of a high pitched hum on these machines. You can actually hear the water flowing through the machine. And um, and just experience that million pounds of rotating mass that's going around uh, two or three times a second. Yeah. I never heard them compared in that way. So thanks, Mike. Because <laughs> I think that is really helpful to like think about these types of units are a lot. They're heavier. They're wider. They rotate slower. You're still getting 60 hertz, yep. but mm -hmm. you're doing it uh, with a lot more mass yep. and at a slower pace. Yep, that's exactly right. Inertia. Yeah. yeah. Going through it. And the water is moving it. 
It is. Yep. <clears throat> Water's flowing through them at high volumes, and uh, and you can literally hear that when you're standing in the in the powerhouse. Okay. And are we going to get to go take some B-roll at the powerhouse after this so we can hear some of it on audio? And maybe we can bribe you later. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more and pivot to, like, the grid services because we talk about, like, the system strength that these types <clears throat> of units can provide. Um, and, and I want it to relate it to, like, the actual services to the grid. I'm going to start with you, Will. And how it connects so 60 hertz gets produced by these big spinny things um can you talk about how all that connects to the bulk electric system then so from the generator to transmission network yeah sure um so let's we'll start at ross ross at the top of the system so 60 hertz we generate electricity at, at each of the generators that comes out at 13.8 kv okay um there's a breaker that connects it to the bulk electrical system and then from there it's stepped up to 240 and that's that brings it down the r1 and the r2 transmission lines from ross to the diablo substation okay uh switch yard uh diablo switch yard is a ring bus that collects that collects the power of the r1 and r2 it also collects the power from the generators at diablo and then sends that those also generate at 13.8 and they're stepped up to 240 and then the power then comes down to d1 d2 d3 and d4 and it's the transmission towers you see going down down river down towards seattle um so d1 and d2 go directly down to uh with the bothell switch okay. yard. uh d3 and four go to gorge the gorge switch yard where it collects the power from gorge uh the same generators generated uh power at 60 hertz um uh, at, at gorge it's not 13.8 it's 11 kv um goes through a breaker, interconnects at the switch yard, and then the D3 and D4 bring the power down to the Seattle. So the uh, we talked about these generators. There's 125 MVA generators. And for each of those, they generate, at, if I heard you right, 13,800 volts. Is that right? Yeah. And then is it a single voltage. breaker for each generator? Yeah. And then... Um, so at, at I for I forget which powerhouse had four of these 125. Ross. So there, that will have four breakers that yeah, comes correct. into a single step up transformer. Two. Two step up. Yeah, Ross has two two step up transformers. So two generators per transformer. Okay. And then, and then two lines coming down, like you said, R1, R2 down to Diablo Switchyard. Okay. And when so the transmission lines from here to Bothell, they're all part. NERC rely like bulk electric system yep. because they're generating correct. at one two thirty kV. That's correct. Yep. Okay. And one fun fact. So there is a line from Gorge to North Mountain. So we actually share North Mountain sub with Snohomish PD. Okay. That's how Snohomish feeds it's a small uh, community of Lag Darrington and there's a lumber mill there, but that's that's the one kind of break in the system between here and Bothell is a single line that goes through North Mountain substation. And is it a tap or is it a, does it come out into a switch yard? Switch yard. Switch yard. <clears throat> okay. And can you talk a little bit about like the protection scheme? So each of those breakers have their own um, individual controls for if there's something that goes wrong with the generator, it'll cut that generator off is that yes yeah, so, protection and control engineer here do we have our own so, you are. Ah, brand. I'm not an engineer it. but I, I was a protection and control electrician i yeah. love a protection and control electrician or engineer both yeah i'm got it's just fun so yeah uh you know like you said the each one of the lines each breaker each piece of equipment we have different protection on all of them different schemes um i, I don't know what you're looking for specifically but uh you know we've got uh we got the whole, uh, I'll, I'll call it the whole smorgasbord of protection up here. We have everything from the most modern um, Schweitzer type relays all the way down to uh, vintage 1940s uh, GE electromechanical relays protecting the generators over at Gorge. You still have some electromechanical. Oh, tons. That's my favorite thing. I, I used to help out at uh, hands-on relay school and teach the electromechanical side. They're my favorite types of relays to work on. We need some pictures of some electro. Do you have any? Do you have any spares that Lots. we can? Oh man. Okay. Let me know if I can auction those off. Like I'll come, no, they're really expensive. Oh, <laughs> they're sure. spares for a reason. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I want to. So this kind of. I think we're going to come back to the protection controls. I'd love to talk more about that when it comes to Black Star capability because yeah. I'm curious about how how the control schemes can change. But Mike, you you started talking about how we are 
part and you know we share a, a substation with Snohomish. Can you talk about how it relates to like the overarching um, bulk electric system in the Northwest, specifically how we how we coordinate with entities like the Western Power Pool and our participation in that broader grid? Yeah, well, um, I guess at the, at the high level, um, the way I talk about it is um, the beauty of hydro, of course. <laughs> I'm, in addition to being the mayor, I'm a self-proclaimed hydro geek, so careful <laughs> careful what you ask for there. Uh, you were the recent chair of the North... National Hydro National Power Hydro Power Association. Yeah. Chair, chair? Chair. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I, I like to think about it in terms of what the machines are capable of doing, which is a, a, a complete variety of grid services that uh, very few in the Northwest, as we most of us know, are, we don't get compensation for, but we do provide the service to the grid. It could be ramping. It could be fast start. It could be um, storage. We have a very large reservoir at Ross Lake that can store one and a half million acre feet of water um, uh, frequency. And we provide reserves. Part of that's by um, our requirements with the NERC as part of our reliability standards. But part of that is we do actually get compensation for some of those reserves and provide those to the grid. They're on call for other utilities to to call us. Um, and we do the same if we need reserves. So we carry a certain amount of reserves. Another beauty of hydro is it can come up and come down really fast. And so... Um, if we're like idling at Ross, for instance, the beauty of those machines, we can idle them at a very low megawatts, close to zero. We call it almost like motoring, but we call it speed no load. And, um, and that provides for every machine 125 MVA of reserve capacity if we need to call upon it <clears throat> or if the system needs to call upon it. So that's the beauty of a resource like Ross or all of, the, all of our hydros. Um, so you, I want to, I want to dive in a little bit more on the, what, what do you call it? speed, no load, yeah. right? So, um, we have the, generally there are spinning reserve requirements, Correct. so that provides a spinning reserve when yes. you do speed, no load. Yeah. Cause you're basically synchronized to the system. You're just not generating any megawatts. Right. And, and talk more about like why that's so nice. Well, uh, I think, <clears throat> gosh, how do I how do I talk about that? I think it's so nice just because of all the things I just talked about. You you have the capability to go from zero to 100, 110 megawatts or one hundred twenty five MBA um, in just a few minutes if you need to call upon that. Uh, it's very valuable for the grid and uh, for the entire Western interconnection, for that matter, to have that that type of uh, capability. So. And I, I went deep on spinning reserves because speed no load to me is one of the beauties of these types of devices. Correct. Um, Correct. Are there any and, other? And Ross, I would say, we're, you know, Ross is super unique in being able to do that. Our other machines um, can do a, ver a version of that, but Ross, um, they specifically designed those for a, a lot of drawdown, so a lot of wide, wide variation of head on that reservoir. We pull it down 100 to 120 feet every year. Um, and those machines are just, uh, they're my favorite turbines <clears throat> and all the work that I've done uh, in this business. Those four machines are my favorite because they behave just beautifully, <laughs> <laughs> no matter what the water conditions are. And that's what allows us the ability to basically take them down to zero megawatts, but keep them synced up to the, to the grid. And so. when you're operating like that, how much water does it take? Does it take much water? And how do you do the linkage? <laughs> Let's say... And next thing we're going to talk about is like a big grid disturbance. Let's say, let's say unexpectedly some big load connects and you need more power and you your spinning reserves get called on. How do you get the water through? Because even if you are spinning speed, no load, once you need power from that unit, it does take water. What's that control mechanism like? So we have, uh, so you have a governor on the machine and okay. it's and it's uh, operating the wicket gates. So the wicket gates go around the outside of the turbine between the scroll case, which is where the water comes in and the turbine. Yep. And so at Ross, the wicket gates, you know, they can either be closed or open and they kind of, it's hard because there's no visual on a podcast, but no, there isn't. Uh, I, I always use my hands, you know, cause they like come together and, open up in and close out but um anyways those the wicket gates around the outside of the turbine if the governor either automatically through a uh, response called droop or if the system calls for um 
you know, an increase in load, they'll open up and they can open up slowly as a ramp rate. If the system calls for it, you know, you can ramp it up over the course of an hour or in the case of droop, if the grid frequency dips and the droop, the automatic built into the governor requires it to open the wicket gates, it can open the wicket gates to full open in like 12 seconds. And as soon as the water's there and the force is on the wheel, that power is on the grid. That's powerful response. So from a few hundred CFS to almost 4,000 for one of those machines. In 12 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive. Okay. So next thing I want to talk about is what happens in the, a moment of a grid disturbance. So whether it be some um, other unit trips offline and there's the same power demand on the grid or if there's a big transmission. Can you talk about in the space, in the, you know, in the gen room? what it sounds like, what it feels like. Is there a visceral response? Oh. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It was always talked about here. It's uh, when when something happens, we call it a bump. You know, okay. we call it, oh, we got bumped again. And the reason it's called a bump is because it, there's a physical response of the generators to the disturbance. If it's a fault on a transmission line, Right, so you've got a million pounds of rotating weight, and when the fault occurs, that that million pounds is magnetically directly linked to the grid. Right, I that's mean, right. Every pole is in phase or just slightly ahead, if you're really into it, of the grid. And as soon as the grid changes, even though with a million pounds of rotating weight, you're not gonna super affect the grid, the grid's super affecting you. So if that, you know, the magnetism changes, that rotor comes directly into response with that. And you feel that throughout the whole plant. I mean, we've had, we've had line disturbances, i.e. trips, great enough that the windows in the control rooms actually move, right? I mean, you feel it. So, uh, so this is exactly the point I think is really important, right? Because these are magnetically linked to the grid. You are you are rotating at the frequency of the grid. Correct. So when you mentioned that it, it's a big enough disturbance to move the windows, like what what is that scale? Like it, what is it a line trip? How big of a line? I mean, where and proximity matters too. I right. assume, like if it's a close line or a far line. Can you talk about like what? I think the worst one that I've ever been in uh, when I was inside a plant was probably like eight years ago. I was at Ross and uh, one of the 500 kV east-west uh, lines, BPA's lines tripped. And we knew exactly when that thing tripped because, I mean, I was I remember walking down at in the hallway at Ross and the door into the control room is shaking. So yeah, it's it's impressive. Again, the physical mass of these machines, it will literally shake the entire powerhouse. And these are concrete structures. It will literally shake them. And you'll feel it in your bones sometimes if it's if it's a hard hit like that 500 trip. So I, I hadn't heard those anecdotes before. I appreciate them because I do think it gets to the whole point of why they're important to have these big machines that will spin and ca and catch and catch the frequency because yes. in fact that's what it's doing right, right it's right. catching the frequency <clears throat> and uh the frequency has to move a million pounds in order to change that's right but we don't want the frequency to change we want it to stay at 60 hertz because yeah. the whole thing's predicated on the 60 hertz and this gets back i love production and control engineers so i'm just gonna, I'm gonna turn to you brant some more okay can you talk about so these are um the the protection and control schemes that enable like you to respond the machines to catch the frequency and not the trip scheme to to catch the frequency sure um i think that in our world is handled in two different ways so we have uh, power system stabilizers on our all of our uh, machines that are greater than 25 mva which okay. is all of ours up here so a power system stabilizer is actually integral to the exciter which seems a little bit out right because you know an exciter you're just making more or less magnetism but the purpose of the power system stabilizer is it's actually using the magnetism of the machine to help uh, stabilize the grid and it does that by you know either like super increasing the magnetism in the generator or like field forcing negative really fast to try to stabilize any of the small swings in the grid but the big one is um, for 
is going back is the governor. So we have <clears throat> every governor has what's called droop and droop in the United States for all the large uh, generators is set at 5%. So what 5% droop means is that that a 5% change in frequency. So um, from 60 hertz, right? Yep. If there's a, What's 5% of 60? 5% of 60 would be 0.3, right? Or, no, 3. I don't know. I'm not three. good at math on the fly. 3. <laughs> I, it's 3. It's not 0.3. It's 3. It's three. Okay. okay, so 3 hertz, right? So 63 to 57. Okay. Okay, so a 3 hertz swing will give you 100% effort of the generator. Okay. So if the wicket gates were set to 50%, and you had a three hertz swing, you'll either get 100% of, you know, so you'll either go back down to pinch if it's an over frequency event. Okay. Or it will go to full wicket gate. And it does that as fast as the machine can respond, which at Ross is about 12 seconds for zero to 100%. So that is, that is like the, the grid, the droop is telling the grid or the governor like go full on or full off because right. I am out of spec and I got to get back to spec. That's is right. that right, Mike? That's right. That's exactly right. And the governor is the beauty of the governor is it's there to make sure it does that and doesn't completely go overshoot one way or the other. It does it in a smooth, even though it's 12 seconds, it can do it very smoothly. Right. Okay. Um, on the protection side, you know, once you get outside those bounds, then you know, there's not a lot that you can do from the protection side except protect your equipment, and then we start having to, you know, trip things offline. Okay. Well, that actually is a great segue to the next topic. It's so it's my understanding that some of these Skagit project generators are black start resources for the grid, and I want to walk through what that means for the operation of the facility and also for the bulk electric systems. I'm going to start with you, Will. What What's the NERC standard that governs Black Star capability and what do y'all have to do in order to be compliant? So the NERC standard, so NERC is the National Electricity Reliability Corporation. They set up standards for protection and... and operating standards for the grid, right? Protection and operating standards. Uh, the the NERC standard for Black Star is EOP005. And that standard basically establishes uh, testing, okay. training, and record retention. Okay. Um, so to have a black start unit, um, you have to test it every three years. Um, you have to train your operators every two years. And what that means for the Skagit, we have two black start units. That's 35 and 36. Okay. The 1.5 MVA units at Diablo. Okay. Um, we do a black start test exercise every single year so we can capture both units and all of our operators uh, and be in compliance because you may miss some operators some years. You may have a unit out on maintenance some years. So we do an annual test. So we reach those two benchmarks of three years for testing and three years for two years for training. Um, can I ask a question about like, so when you test for black start, that means these generators are disconnected. So you open up some breakers here. So we open up the breakers. We usually work with 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 North Mountain and um, and Diablo. Okay. So we open up the breakers. The line we're black. We're in the black. So there's no station service. There's no there's no grid. Yep. The room we're sitting in has no power. <laughs> this room is powered by those units. So no. Then, okay. Okay. Well, we'll have power down here. Okay. <laughs> Um, the way we test it, we all have power. Okay. So, but the, the 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 circuit, the line that they're testing is in the black. The power is in the black. Okay. Um, so in the dark. So the requirement is you have a certain amount of time that you have to be able to bring your black start unit up, and then bring your main units up and charge the line or charge the circuit. Okay. So for Diablo, our black start units, we we test alternate thirty five or thirty six. So we we're in the black. We bring up one of the small hydro units. Uh, to restore station service, and then from there we can take one of the big units, uh, 31 or 32, and then charge the line. Okay. And is this similar to like, would you call it speed no load? Because you're no. just bringing up free voltage um, on the line, or how does how does yeah? So so speed no, speed no load is your unit is online. It's connected. The breakers closed to the the grid to the bulk electrical system, but it it, it could be at zero. But it is connected, so you can immediately bring it up to whatever whatever uh, megawatt value, whatever you want. power requirement, whatever power you want. Um, 
so with you know Black Star units, you're you're put basically putting the unit online to charge the transmission line uh, with the power you need, and then you'll bring it up to whatever megawatt value it demands from there. And Will, I don't even know. Do we do we do we manually open the wickets on thirty five and thirty six, or do we run them through batteries? How how do we get power to those little machines? It's a one thirty no... battery bank, right? Yeah, the, those those governors actually have a. Those governors actually have a battery-powered governor oil pump. But it is, so the power you're producing is just enough to offset the resistance of the line. Right. So right. Because you can't actually produce power, or else it just short somewhere. Well, you right? know, if you use the old beer analogy for megawatts and megavars, yeah. right? So uh, the charging of the line... It's all is all megavars, so it's all foam, right? And in this case, for our generators at Diablo, which have been built overrated in the Exciter department for this reason, it's about 40 megavars to charge the line on initial charge to get back to Bothell. So you're just you're just running the imaginary power all the way all the way up to charge the line to Bothell, okay? And then so talk us through. In, a, in an actual Black Start event, what do we do? How do we resync this with the grid? So on on that one, uh, so we build so we build up a network of generators up here, and we build up load down in Seattle, and they do that in a coordinated method to, okay. you know, we add some gen, they add some load because the the grid is stable because the load is stable, right? It's not just the generators, right. it's, you know, as load load by percentage is fairly stable. So imagine a black, all of Seattle, all of Puget Sound, you know, all the Western grid at this point, we're trying to bring things back in a controlled manner so that we have load to support the gens. Yep. And so we'll start adding load by closing in even distribution circuits down in Seattle and they'll add, add distribution circuits. And then when we get to the point where maybe we have Seattle mostly restored and BPA is starting to restore, we have to tie those two systems back together. How do we tie them together? Man, that's a tough one. So uh, you can't just like take one generator and increase the frequency or decrease the frequency, right? Now we have our own grid. Seattle City Light is its own grid and BPA is a separate grid. So the way that they actually put those together is, you know, we have sync scopes. So a sync scope is watching the system at a breaker at one of our substations where we tie to another utility and they actually have a procedure to to you know trip load offline or increase load to change the frequency of our system to match the other system so you got so a sync scope do we have one on site oh lots yeah lots of them oh man we need to take a video of a sync scope <laughs> so we can put that in in post okay so somebody's sitting there watching a sync scope and the sync scope is you see the frequency uh, it's like an oscilloscope it's like, like a clock so it's a it's a one-handed clock and one -handed it's clock and it's it telling says, you the difference in frequency between two points right oh so 12 o'clock that's unity that's 60 hertz and and then it spins really fast in one direction that means that you're faster than whatever you're trying to tie to and if it spins really fast counterclockwise it means they're faster than you and then you want it to be nice and slow and then once it comes up to 12 o'clock top dead center you close in and that's how you sync oh this sounds so cool we're gonna sync across two of the breakers for bank 27 And it's in phase. Already. It's a scope that measures the difference in frequency between two point two Basically, sides yeah, of a, a breaker. It's a synchronous a motor. Yeah. Yeah. It's a synchronous motor. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And if it isn't moving, it's not doesn't have any slip. Right. Okay. Oh, this is fascinating. So then somebody somewhere watches one of these and closes a breaker. Yeah, I don't want to get too deep into no, the whole plans, but don't I don't want it to is a, it is a thing right i mean you've got to they got to be right there on site they've got to be coordinating with the dispatchers cutting load adding load and then right when it gets perfect tie them back together and that's one of the services that these units provide that's correct <clears throat> yeah and that's one of the magic of a big spinny thing yeah, is exactly it actually will control the frequency <laughs> and in this case a small big thing big spinny or small spinny thing but it still has enough mass to charge our transmission all the way to bothell 
Mike said it really well. I mean, you know, speed, no load, the reserves, that's the beauty of hydro. Um, if you think how long it takes to get a, a gas plant up to speed generating or a geothermal or coal or nuclear, I mean, we could do it instantly, 12 seconds. And, you know, we operate <clears throat> this camp that we're in here, like when there's a wildfire, we have to shut down transmission to Seattle. They can operate power here and basically island these two towns from Diablo so that the towns get electricity. They're generating it close to 60 hertz most of the time, but they are islanded from the grid. If our transmission is cut off, these towns are islanded. So that's the other beauty of those, those types of machines is to be able to run independent of the grid. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, this season, we're collecting any advice from practitioners that, that for people, listeners that are policymakers, researchers, or anything else. I'll start with you, Brant. You know, frontline protection and control background. Um, uh, anything advice you have for researchers, industry leaders like Mike or, <laughs> or uh, researchers like me? Anything, yeah. Um, you know, just as as we move more into DERs and to, you know, renewables are a daily part of our lives now, right? I mean, yep. we we see it every morning. We see it in the weather. I mean, I can almost forecast the weather by how the generators change because if it's nice and sunny, you know, there's a lot of PV out there, then the generators are, you know, a lot lower in megawatts, especially this time of year where we're trying to conserve water. Uh, if it starts to get windy, again, in Eastern Washington, particularly for us, you know, the load dies down. But as we as we move deeper and deeper into that, I think it's really important for the industry to to look at the value of hydro and try to f figure out a way, maybe to make compensation for hydro for what we do provide. I mean, the the grid would not be able to su survive PV wind any of this other uh you know renewables that are coming online if it was only backed by thermal power got it what about you will any advice for planners like me just to add on to what brand said you know hydro you know if you don't have if you don't have you know fossil power hydro's hydro is the replacement for that you couldn't have your wind your wind are you know they're asynchronous generators that what we started out with uh there's a lot of wind. My last company had a lot of wind, you know, right across from North Dakota to Texas. Um, you know, hydro is a valuable resource, and especially with our storage capacity, you know, we can't store uh, we can't store energy the way we would want to. So these reservoirs are super important. Um, being able to use them, um, and then I think just maintenance strategies, you know, uh -huh. operating and maintaining this facility. Uh, you know, we're getting better at coordinating our maintenance with the marketing uh, people, and that, that's been a good thing. That's um, a great thing. Thank uh, you for doing that with us. It's important. Because <laughs> um, and, and we are starting to talk about the cost of outages, yeah. uh, which is important. Can we shorten outages? Can we, can we move outages? Can we you know, add a shift to an outage or something? I think that's important. You know, and some, some of what Brand said is, you know, can we be compensated for that? You know, a budgetary budgetary processes currently don't do that so we can spend our budget to make power um there needs to be a circle close that loop on that um yeah moving forward get compensated for spin no load he's, ta he's talking to me when i know he's that. talking to, <laughs> I, yeah he's talking to others talking to the room they may, they may also uh any other advice you have mike for the, our public power underground audience you know, um, it's just uh, some of the things I like to talk about are just <clears throat> the way I roll, just uh, always ask questions. These guys know that I ask a lot of questions. <clears throat> um, I think that just, number one, you're showing interest, but <clears throat> but it's a constant learning environment. Always be curious. Um, try to understand how we fit into the big picture. Um, I think it's important, and these guys have done a great job explaining how we fit into the big picture. I think just continuing to convey that message to kind of people that we network with and with our interns. We've got three interns up here today. Talk to them about how important this is, what it takes to make electricity, growing the future generations of people that are doing what we're doing. Um, be adaptive. you got to listen. you got to be adaptive, you know. Um, 
and be able to be willing to pivot and make changes with Brent talked about demand, distributed energy resources, demand response, all these new things that are coming on board, which is kind of new for the Northwest that we're going to figure it out because that's what our customers want. And lastly, I'll say just sitting next to two really smart people is, you know, hire smart people, give them tools to succeed and get the heck out of their way <laughs> and they will do good things. Yeah, we need to train more production and control uh, professionals. That's for sure. I love of wireman professional yeah. protection controls folks more people in the trades and more people in the trades um i hope you feel seen heard valued, and appreciated brand do you i do Thank good you. Uh, good well i hope you feel seen heard sure. valued, and appreciated appreciate you welcoming us up here uh the interns as well to come take a tour of the facility and and mike i appreciate you thank <laughs> you for your questions and your curiosity i hope you feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated. I do. And if I just put a shameless plug in for National Hydropower Day on August 24th, <clears throat> uh, let's do it for hydro. That's right. August 24th, National Hydropower Day. I didn't know that. I should have been up to speed on that one. Thanks, Mike. Uh, now back to Almaz Conley and Farhad for more energy enthusiasm. Thank you all for doing this again uh, across the globe, uh, coming to join for the conversation. Almaz, I hope you feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated. Of course, I do. Conley, you're coming back to the U.S. soon. Um, I hope your trip is wonderful and safe, and I hope you feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated. Thanks, Paul. I do. Good. And Farhad, from, from Australia to our ears, uh, with interpretive dancing along the way, uh, I, is there, I hope you feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated. Indeed. Thank you. To our listeners, while you aren't seen or heard, you are valued and appreciated. Roll on, enthusiasts. Roll on. We started in hard times to bring us all in. Into the laughter through thick and through thin for public power enthusiasts. Public Power Underground is a production of News Data and Seattle City Light. You don't have to be subscribed to News Data's weekly newsletter to get this podcast, but it sure makes the podcast make a lot more sense. The views expressed here are own and not the official views of Seattle City Light, Tacoma Power, SP Global, News Data, or the organization of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Today's episode was, was written and produced by Paul Dockery, Almaz Nagesh, Conley Byers, and Farhad Bilamoria, and it's edited and published by the stellar team of Pioneer Utility Resources with sound mixing by Lucas Smith and video editing by Brendan Delzer. Our theme song, Roll on Enthusiast, was rewritten, performed, and recorded by Aaron Guillory and Ian Bledsoe. You can find Public Power Underground on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Please share with the energy enthusiasts in your life and give us a rating and review on your app of choice if you enjoyed the content. It helps other energy enthusiasts like us find us. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch. <laughs>